Mary. I don't know if I like you or not, Pierce. I don't know if anyone does like you. I know full well many who hate you. Pierce, you are too dark in yourself. You don't make friends with the gales. You avoid their company. When you come among them, you bring a dark cloud with you that lies heavily on them. Is it your English blood that is the cause of this, I wonder? I suppose there are two pierces, the somber and taciturn pierce, and the gay and the sunny pierce. The gay and the sunny pierce is seen too seldom. I don't like that gloomy pierce, he gives me the shivers. And the most curious part of the story is that no one knows which is the true Pierce. The defendant has exercised his right to henceforth conduct his own defense. Accordingly, I call upon the defendant, Patrick Pierce, to open the case for the defense. You don't expect me to listen to you up there, do you? If you're going to make your case, you'll do it from the bench. Fellow citizens, Irish citizens, I wish to talk to you for a moment about a country with a noble history, a country with an ancient literature, a vibrant culture, a proud country, but a small country, a small island country off the west coast of Europe, a country called Great Britain. Britain is at war. And nobody is certain what the future may hold. But one cannot plan for a future if one cannot imagine it. I ask you here today to consider Britain's future if Germany were to win this great war. Germany, as ruler now, of course, insists its intentions are benevolent. It means only to improve Britain. Germany is proud of its democracy, its rule of law, and its education system. So Britain should be grateful for the improvements it has brought. Germany even allows England to elect representatives to the parliament in Berlin, where they sit in permanent minority, unable to affect any change. German officials control the judicial system, and German money controls the newspapers, all ensuring they reflect proper morality, German morality. British parents find their children coming home from school, talking of what they learned in class, how Germany has rescued England from its backward ways. Thank heavens, they learn only German now, so they can get ahead in the world. English, and with it its history, culture, and heritage, it's a waste of our children's time. Perhaps you can imagine unrest in this future. A revolt against the German occupation. Naturally, Germany speaks of violent radicals who endanger our future. Children are taught to denounce these agitators as traitors. Then, when they come of age, they can be sent to foreign lands to defend Germany's honor and interests on the battlefield. If you can imagine this future, you have already imagined Ireland's past. In that future, who would dare say to an Englishman, he has no right to resist foreign rule, and yet they say it to us here today? Gentlemen, to convict me of treason is to say loudly we have no such rights. In the coming days, piece by piece, 
I will call witnesses to prove that what we did was not only right, but necessary and justified by history. Thank you. The defense calls Commandant General James Connolly. My lord, aside from calling such a disreputable witness, the rank given to him is entirely spurious. Commandant General, he was the leader of a rabble, not an army. Calling my witness disreputable before he even takes the stand, if that's not prejudicial, I don't know what is. Gentlemen, let's allow the witness to establish his own appellation, shall we? Commandant, Mr. Connolly, were you a founder of the Irish Citizen Army? I was. And what is your rank in that organization? Commandant General. And in that position, Commandant Connolly, what led you to take up arms against the British Empire? My lord, this court is not a vehicle for propaganda. My defense is not a technical one. I'm entitled to establish the justice of our cause. Mr. Connolly is here to do just that. I'll allow the witness to continue. But let's not go back 700 years, hmm? Mr. Connolly. Commandant Connolly, could you tell the court how and why you came to establish the Irish Citizen Army? And as the Right Honourable Judge said, I think you may allied the plantations, the penal laws, and the Great Famine. I can only agree. There is too much death and injustice to speak of. Mr. Pierce. Commandant. In the winter of 1913, the workers tried to unionize to protect basic rights and rates of pay. The bosses locked them out of their jobs before they could even strike. Then they starved their families into submission. We formed the Irish Citizen Army to advance the cause of labor and freedom in Ireland. The death rate in Dublin is the highest in any city in Europe. TB spreads like wildfire through the tenements because of the cramped conditions. Let me give you just one example. On Henrietta Street, 835 people live in just 15 houses. The government does nothing about this because they are not here to see it. And this is why you took up arms against the Crown. You cannot build a free nation on the basis of slavery. You can never have freedom or self-respect whilst you have starvation. There are some who might say that starvation has nothing to do with a flag that flies over your head. Perhaps these people would be no better off in an Irish Republic. We stated our case for Irish men and women in the proclamation. I'm afraid I don't have a copy to hand. The Republic guarantees religious and civil liberty, equal rights and equal opportunities to all its citizens and declares its resolve to pursue the happiness and prosperity of the whole nation and of all its parts, cherishing all of the children of the nation equally and oblivious of the differences. Thank you, Mr. Commandant Connolly. Commandant Connolly, or should I say Private Connolly? After all, that was your rank in the British Army, was it not? How long did you serve in the British Army, Private Connolly? From the age of 14 to 20, I think. You don't seem very certain of when you left. It was a long time ago. Perhaps that's because you left somewhat early. I spent six years in the Army, voluntarily. If anything, I left too late. I suggest you deserted, Mr. Connolly. 
I saw the poison from the inside, Mr. Banks. Like too many of my kind, I joined because of poverty. I served. I grew disillusioned. I left. I fight for the working man, not the empire. And that entitles you to take up arms against the very army you once deserted, an army that is itself composed of the working men you supposedly champion. Working men? Serving a capitalist system that represses them? Men who in many cases are themselves Irish. 116 soldiers killed, Mr. Connolly. 22 of them Irish. 16 policemen killed, all of them Irish. I lament that fact, but they were on the wrong side of history. You say you joined the British Army at 14? That's right. And how did they let you in at such a young age? I lied. I'm sure you did. exactly do you think you're doing? An army fights on its stomach. You and Connolly. A little army of socialists. Connolly is an Irish patriot. He was in the British Army. I wasn't aware. Nobody was. <clears throat> Connolly's a bloody Bolshevik. He strikes the fear of God into middle-class Dublin. What harm? What harm? You need people on your side to set the agenda. Influential people. Let's say the prosecution can't prove assisting the enemy. The jury will still convict on all of the charges. If you haven't swayed the public, they'll hang you, regardless. Don't you think I know that? You think I'd deny the German plot to save my skin? It's not what I'm suggesting. I'm no coward. The longer that question remains open, the longer we have the public's ear. If you win hearts and minds, you'll be spared. If you fail and the public hate you, you'll die. Start fighting for clemency. Because getting it is the only way you'll know you've won. Tone and Emmett never sought mercy. They weren't afraid to die. They failed, Patrick. That's not something to celebrate. Instead of dying for an unrealized freedom, you could live to make it happen. You know the problem with pragmatists, George? They lack moral fiber. Better than lacking a heartbeat. Work with me. Call only the right people. We justify you and we justify your actions. Proving the justice of our cause means exposing the injustice of theirs. That's what Connolly was for. It has to be in terms they understand the terms they've used against you. Atrocities, murder, blood on the streets. This is O'Rourke. What happened on North King Street on Friday, April 28th? On Friday, the military entered my house. They hold the licensed premises. They made prisoners of all of us, me, my three children, the cook, and a man named Paddy Beelan. <clears throat> On Tuesday evening, my husband, Francis Sheehy Skeffington, who was a noted pacifist, I might add, was walking home across Portobello Bridge. He was alone and unarmed when he was arrested and taken to Portobello Barracks. The following morning, they took Paddy out of the kitchen and brought him downstairs. They brought him down to the cellar and they were told to shoot him. The captain, Bowen Colthurst, demanded my husband and two other prisoners from the guard. He said he was going to shoot them. Paddy said his prayers. One of them told me he felt bad for shooting him because Paddy'd made them all tea. He told me he couldn't shoot him fair-faced. 
So they told Paddy to go down to the foot of the stairs. And they left banging him. When they reached the end of the yard, Colthurst gave an order to fire. And my husband and the other two dropped in their tracks, dead. Paddy's body was discovered buried in the cellar. There was another body with them, a local fella who labored in the distillery, James Healy. They put my husband's body in a sack and buried him in the barracks yard. A week later, they exhumed his body and reburied him in Glasnevin. Without even telling me. No questions, my lord. I fear we chose unwisely. We should have acted while we had support. We simply chose the long road. The destination will be the right one. We've given him a platform. And a rope to hang himself. I don't see any rope. I see an agitator trying to embarrass us. The more of his cronies he calls, the more we can expose them. It won't last. It had better not. Mr. Banks, explain yourself. My lord, the defense has elected to call George Gavin Duffy as his next witness. Yes. It's patently ridiculous. He's calling his own solicitor to be his mouthpiece. What next? Are we to let him eat lunch with the jury? There is no legal rule or precedent preventing my solicitor giving evidence. But as it happens, I dismissed my legal team. Mr. Gavin Duffy is present now merely as an amicus curiae, a friend of the court. It is unusual, but perfectly valid. Call the jury in. Mr. Duffy, please tell the court Must I be hanged? Mr. Pierce, you know well enough that your guilt or innocence is a matter for the jury, and your sentence is a matter for me, and me alone. My question is a technical one. As a legal expert, does Mr. Duffy know of relevant precedents? Proceed, Mr. Pierce, with caution. You are charged with high treason. That is a capital crime. The usual punishment on conviction is death. But there can be exceptions. Such as? A necessity defense. Take self-defense, for example. When governments oppress a people, armed protest could, in theory, be seen as a kind of public self-defense. And is there such a precedent for armed protest? The British government are currently seeking the support of the United States in its war effort. Yet the United States rose up against Britain and won its independence by force of arms. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed with unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that whenever any government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government. The American Declaration of Independence, as clear a statement of treason as was ever uttered against the Crown. Nobody was charged. And today, they are allies. To be clear, Mr. Duffy, are you saying that the founding fathers of the United States, men now considered paragons of democracy, were once insurrectionists? Precisely. No further questions. Mr. Duffy, you are qualified in the law. I am a solicitor, Mr. Banks. I qualified in London. And as such, you believe in the law, Mr. Duffy. I have devoted my life to it. But yet you are, in effect, citing the learned Mr. Bumble. I don't follow. A favorite character of Mr. Charles Dickens, my lord responsible for that timeless piece of jurisprudence, the law is an ass. I may have devoted my life to the law, Mr. Banks, but no lawyer would claim the law is immutable. It changes. Does that give you license to disregard it in the present? Surely, Mr. Banks, if the law may change in the future, does that not allow that the law may be flawed? It is my job to ask the questions, Mr. Duffy. A question is often the best answer. Gentlemen, 
This is my courtroom, not a university debating society. Do you or the defendant assume the right to decide which laws you may break? Slavery was legal in the colonies not so long ago. Would you prosecute a slave for resisting captivity? Once again, that is not an answer. History is written by the victors, but so is the law. I believe the cause of liberty is inexorable. Ireland will have its victory sooner or later because it is righteous and just. My law. If the law is on the wrong side of history, the jury has the opportunity to give it a push. This is preposterous. Mr. Duffy, I will instruct the jury, not you. My courtroom is no place for political statements. My lord, Patrick Pierce's actions may be illegal, but to hang him for the pursuit of liberty, that would be the ultimate political statement. No further questions, my lord. I'll give no more oxygen to this propaganda. We will adjourn until this afternoon. All rise. Make this count. Clemency is there for you if you want it. Lady Gregory, would you tell the court your impression of the work done at St. Endes School? I have come to know St. Endes through its pioneering use of drama in education and its ongoing association with the Abbey Theatre, of which I am a director. A lot has been said about the supposed ideology espoused in the school. What was your understanding? My Lord, St. Enda's school is not on trial. Mr. Banks, you used it to blacken my name. Suddenly it's off limits. You put it on the table, Mr. Banks. Apologies. The students were taught that the soul should be nourished as much as the mind. That Irish culture was as valuable as any other and should be cherished. If that's an ideology, I admire it. Would you consider that Mr. Pierce had a strong influence over the boys at St. Enders? Oh, yes. I had never seen anything like it. And do you think this might have been a factor in a number of them following him into insurrection and even into death? I keep wondering whether we could not have brought them into the intellectual movement instead. The intellectual movement? Yes. I believe Patrick to be an intellectual. He wrote plays, essays, poems. He edited on Clive Sullish. The newspaper, for the benefit of those of us who don't speak the Irish patois... It means the sword of light. A military sword. On the contrary a symbol of intellectual freedom. And yet, did Mr. Pierce once say the Gaelic League brought to Ireland not peace, but a sword? <laughs> a matter of perspective. You mentioned the defendant's poetry as evidence of his good character. If you would be kind enough to read the underlined passages in the document in front of you. Do you need a moment? Have you not seen this before? No. I have. Well, perhaps you can tell the court what it is. It's a poem. Written by the defendant and entitled Little Lad of the Tricks, Yes. Once again, the prosecution is straying from the facts to blacken my name. Apparently, it's on the table. By common consent, my lord. Mr. Pierce, indeed, uh, your good name has nothing to do with your innocence or guilt. But if you invoke it to prove that your motives were noble, prosecution is more than entitled to counter. Please, if you would oblige me, Lady Gregory, if you could read the underlined passages. I forgive you, 
child of the soft red mouth. I will not condemn anyone for a sin not understood. Raise your comely head till I kiss your mouth. There is a fragrance in your kiss that I have not found yet in the kisses of women or in the honey of their bodies. He who has my secrets is not fit to touch you. Is not that a pitiful thing, little lad of the tricks? These are just words. I think they speak for themselves. This is not a deed. It's not a diary entry. It's a poem. And one that I believe was originally written in Irish. You're interpreting it for your own end. I leave it for the jury to decide. No further questions. Trust me, Patrick, it will backfire. To publicly harass a lady of such standing with unfounded, salacious tactics like that, it won't work. The jury, the press, everyone will see through it. It's desperation. Why would they be desperate, George? They're winning. In the courtroom, maybe, but not in the streets. You're not out there, Patrick. You can't see the tide turning. Even the press are starting to change their tune. The Prime Minister has been in touch. This is on both our heads. Don't let this break you. I know that poem wasn't meant like that. What's this? I thought you might need some help. You wanted a smoking gun? Now you have one. Mr. Plunkett. The prosecution painted our surrender as an act of desperation. They used it to question our cause. Could you elaborate on the status of the garrisons on the day of surrender? <coughs> Take your time. Bolland's Bakery, Marybone Lane, South Dublin Union. Well, they were all well armed, well provisioned and uh, resisting right to the end. Do you believe it's fair to say that they could have held out indefinitely? Yes, indeed. So why surrender? The British were shelling indiscriminately, and the city was burning. In front of us on Moore Street, three civilians lay dead, caught in the crossfire. I can remember one man. A bullet had snapped his neck, I think. His head was tilted to one side. His eyes were open, staring. It's not what we were fighting for. I thank you for coming here under difficult circumstances. And I thank you for your courage. No further questions. You believe this was a noble fight, Mr. Plunkett? The most noble. An honest fight? I believe so. The proclamation referred to your gallant allies in Europe. What of them? We fought alone. Fought alone, perhaps, but did you plan alone? Do you know the town of Limburg in Germany, Mr. Plunkett? I'm aware of it, yes. Come now, you have visited, have you not? It was the location of a prisoner of war camp, correct? Yes, I have visited. I'm not entirely sure what that proves. You met Casement there, is that correct? I did. 
Saturday, 8th of May, Limburg, 18 recruits today. Monday, 10th of May, 10 recruits today. Tuesday, 18th of May, dinner with Captain Berm and Casement, meeting about a plan of campaign. Is this your diary, Mr. Plumkin? <coughs> I understand you're ill, Mr. Plunkett, but I need an answer. Is that your handwriting? Yes. Whatever that is, it has not been entered in evidence. Mr. Banks, explain yourself. Apologies, my lord. An inexcusable oversight. I'll withdraw it immediately. Do you deny that you traveled to Germany to recruit Irishmen from the ranks of British prisoners of war? Irish men who would be better fighting for their country than rotting in a German camp. Irish men who voluntarily took an oath to serve the king and who are willing to forsake it to save their skins. Men of no integrity, soldiers of fortune. And you call this a fair fight, Mr. Plunkett? I would remind the jury that collaboration with the enemy is tantamount to treason. No further questions, my lord. What was it you said? Clemency is there if you want it. Strange. I don't see it. This is your final witness, Mr. Pierce. I wish to call Mr. William James Pierce. My lord, the prisoners are kept apart for good military reasons. They are clearly attempting to communicate using the good offices of this court as a cover. I suppose we're going to launch another rising by means of a secret code word. Again and again, the defendant seeks to abuse this court for the purposes of propaganda. Somewhat rich after your dirty tricks with a diary, Mr. Banks. I must stand on my right to call my own witnesses. Mr. Pierce. You may call your witness, but I warn you, do not overstep the mark. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Mr. Pierce. Do you think I should die for what I've done? The Lord says, judge not, lest ye be judged. I took up arms, Pat, just as you did. If I say yes, I only condemn myself. If I say no, what weight does it hold? I do know this. We've been soldiering companions since we were boys. True brothers and friends. And if you're condemned, I'll be following right behind. But don't go down easy, Pat. You'll be taking me with you. No further questions. No questions, my lord. We shall hear the closing statements in the morning. Adjourned. All rise.
Will you hear my confession, Father? Of course. In the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen. Go ahead, my son. I'm afraid, Father. That's not a sin. I'm not sure you have time for all my others. I'm not sure you believe there are many others. Perhaps that's your greatest sin. Sorry, Father. The prisoner's mother is here. We shall talk again tomorrow, Patrick. I heard what Willie said. He always followed me. I can't stop him now. What is one mother against fate? Against God? I robbed no bank, I spilled no blood, though they sent me to jail. Because, because I, I was a done and a man, Rosa, and a son of Groyway. Rosa. He sounded like a king. I always thought of you in the same way. I was a teacher, Mother. Maybe that's how I should have stayed. You'll always be a teacher, Patrick. Do me one favor. Whatever they call me, good or bad, they never really knew me. Not like you and Willie did. I need you to remember me as I am. That's all. Mr. Banks, your closing remarks? The facts are clear and undisputed. Patrick Pierce, by his own admission, led an armed rebellion against His Majesty's government. By any definition, that is treason, and it is punishable by death. It seems the case for the defense was purely political, and seeking some form of clemency in sentencing. This is a court of law. It doesn't deal in politics. Perhaps the jury has been swayed by the notion that this rebellion was somehow just or moral. Perhaps you are inclined towards leniency, choosing to convict on the lesser charges available. If so, I ask you to put yourself in the shoes of a soldier on the Western Front. A terrified young conscript has deserted and been caught. The boy must be court-martialed and shot. It is harsh, but there is no other way in a time of war. Discipline must be preserved. Now ask yourself how you would explain your decision to that soldier on the front. 
The reality is that this sorry matter comes down to one thing and one thing only. The will of the people. And the people did not want this rebellion. When the Irish volunteers split, 175,000 of them followed John Redmond, a constitutional nationalist. 13,500 followed Pierce and his comrades. On Easter Monday, they had perhaps a thousand men under their command in the Dublin Rising. Meanwhile, 150,000 Irish men were under the command of Field Marshal Kitchener on the Western Front. Let's not forget, Pierce even betrayed the constitutions of the very organizations to which he swore oaths because they required the will of the people. Liberty is a fine thing. It is a noble thing to wish for. But what is it for if it is not for the will of the people? The Irish people want home rule. They did not want this rebellion. And therefore, no matter how you choose to represent it, it is impossible to condone. For this reason, Patrick Pierce deserves to be found guilty. But for crimes of deceit, delusion, vanity, and arrogance, he deserves to be forgotten. Mr. Pierce. Mr. Pierce, your closing remarks to the jury. Gentlemen, perhaps Mr. Banks is right. Perhaps I do deserve to die. I have never denied my actions, and I understand the law that is imposed on Ireland by the British. I must admit I find it difficult to speak here today. I'm aware of my reputation as an orator, but I'm more accustomed to speaking of ideas and ideals greater than myself. Less than a year ago, I was called upon to give a graveside speech at the funeral of the great Irish rebel, O'Donovan Rossa. To prepare, I traveled down to my cottage in Connemara. I spent days walking the Atlantic shore and watching the slanting sun and the shadows on the green hills. I turned to the Bible. St. Paul believed the law of Christ was more meaningful than the law of the land. In his epistle to the Galatians, he says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. I thought upon the history of Irishmen who fought to fulfill Christ's promise of freedom. Not just O'Donovan Rossa, but Robert Emmett, Wolf Tone, and all the great Fenians that have gone before me. I knew I must follow these men and light a fuse that would lead to this day and almost certainly to my death. I wrote the words and saw the burning fires of the GPO and my own end within them. Ireland unfree shall never be at peace. But I was wrong. My mistake was in believing that I was following great men. But I never knew those Fenians. To me, they have never been men in flesh and blood. They are something greater. They are an idea. They are an idea held in the hearts and minds of generations that have followed long after their passing. And I've learned one thing this past few weeks. Men and women, we have no control over an idea. We may argue and cajole it, manipulate it and wrestle it into submission, but it will always escape our grasp. 
an idea that lives on lives not in the mind of a man, but in the minds of many, and that is why it can never be conquered or tamed. I know now I cannot control it. I am but a man, a man who has lived with conflict within me. I am a man who must finally admit that deep in my soul I do not want to die. Yet I must accept that I may. This court decide if I get to live. But the unborn generations of the future will decide if I will become something more. An idea worth remembering. The beauty of the world has made me sad. This beauty that will pass, things young and happy. And then my heart hath told me these will pass. Will pass and change, will die and be no more. Things bright and green things young and happy. And I have gone upon my way, sorrowful. One hundred years ago to the day, Patrick Pierce was sentenced to death. Now a contemporary jury assembled to pass their verdict as they must answer one of the most divisive questions in Irish history. Was Patrick Pierce, as the personification of the 1916 Rising, guilty or not guilty? Tomorrow night at 9 on TV3.